Shalom, this is the Messianic Drew again, doing a presentation on some of the research I've been doing. I spent the summer at Oxford, which is why I haven't been uploading many videos lately, but I finished with that, and I'm going to give you some of my research here, which I hope to do eventually in a dissertation. So, my, uh, my presentation here is the ontological argument for the existence of God, which I've given in a previous video, and the use of Harvey Friedman's concept calculus to, to create a consistency theorem for a perfect being theology. And so that's basically the point of my presentation. Okay, so as a quick background to the ontological argument, Anselm of Canterbury came up with this idea that God is not just a powerful being or the creator, but the perfect being. If you could conceive of something that's greater than God, then that would be God. But in his view, there's two kinds of existence. There's beings that exist in the understanding. This might be like a painting in the painter's mind. But once the painter finishes the painting, now it exists in his understanding and also in reality. But if God were to exist in the understanding alone and not in reality, then God wouldn't be the greatest possible being. But if he exists in reality and in the understanding, then maybe he's the greatest possible being. Therefore, he exists in reality. Now, Kant has probably has the strongest criticism of Anselm. Uh, he believed that existence uh, is not really a predicate. He says Anselm's argument presupposes that there really is this distinction that existence is actually a property of something. And so you can't say that. When I deny that there is this existing perfect being, I'm not denying any of the predicates. All I'm doing is erasing the subject and eliminating any predicates that might go along with it. And so, therefore, he believes the ontological argument just isn't useful. He believes it's a failed argument. And this has sort of been the canonical criticism against Anselm. Now, there's no real proof that Anselm required existence to be a predicate. If we go back, we can see he never says existence is a predicate. He says that there's existence in the understanding and existence in reality. But, of course, Kant just didn't believe in that distinction. He just had a different view of metaphysics than Anselm did. So, if you believe existence in the mind is actual real existence and that, that it's different from the understanding, this isn't much of a criticism to you. If you do, then maybe it's a, it can be a showstopper. So the question is, is existence really a predicate? Well, let's think about it for a second. We can, we can say if I have an ad for my car, and I say my car is you know, 12 years old, it's got 160,000 miles, it's blue, uh, existing, you know, one, one of these just really doesn't seem to make sense. But on the other hand, when we compare, let's say, two attorneys, Jack McCoy from Law and Order and Jerry Spence, a real-life attorney who's just, who's won case after case, he's probably the winningest attorney still alive today, you could say, who's the greater attorney? And people can come up with the arguments, it's like, what about this guy in this case, and this guy in this case? But you might say, hey, you know, at least at least Jerry Spence exists. Like, Jack McCoy is a fictional character. He doesn't actually exist. But Jerry Spence, yeah, he actually exists. And so that can be a benefit for him. But that requires us to assume that existence is something we can say of something. So maybe existence is a predicate. But uh, maybe, maybe not. So if we reject that existence is a predicate... Uh, we can still come up with a version of the ontological argument. Now, we have this idea of epistemic, logical, and metaphysical possibility. So when I say, you know, it's possible that there's this hard math problem, it's possible that there's an answer for it. What I'm really saying is, all for all I know, it might be true. For all I know, I know there might be an answer to this math problem. But I mean that in an epistemic sense. For all I know, such and such is true. That's different from logical possibility, which is like, is this thing logically coherent or not? Is this theorem coherent or is there a contradiction in it? Uh, if it's really complicated, maybe for all I know, it, it you know has a contradiction or doesn't have a contradiction. But when we talk about logical possibility, one or the other is absolutely true, regardless of what I know about it. So that's a different sense of, of possibility. It's logically possible. But for the ontological argument, we're dealing with metaphysical possibility. Now, metaphysical possibility is dealing with which way reality could and could not be configured. And you could say things like, uh, is there a possible world, which is a way reality could be, okay, you know, a way that reality could be configured as a possible world, uh, and a being that exists in all ways that reality could be configured is a necessary being. Uh, so, 
we had, we could ask, uh, could uh, the prime minister have been a prime number? There's no internal logical contradiction to it, but there doesn't seem to be a way reality could be configured whereby that's true. Or I could say, you know, could this thing, and I, I've got this object, could this object have been made of uranium? And most people would say no. Uh, anything that's made of uranium just would be a different object. It wouldn't have the same identity. But we're not talking about, like, the predicate of words. Remember, it's this object. I haven't specified it as a pen or anything else. I just said this thing. Could that object have had uh, maybe a few scratches on it and maintain its identity? Well, probably. I mean, you scratch the pen, it's, this, it's the same object. But uh, if it were made of uranium, uh, that, that just isn't the same object. It's, it's not possible. There's no way reality could, could be configured whereby that object uh, has a different composition. So we do seem to have an understanding at not just about the definitions of words, but possibility goes beyond just the definitions of words. It goes into our beliefs and our understanding and our knowledge of which ways reality can and cannot be configured. And so we'll use this to argue for God. So we have this distinction between maximal greatness and maximal excellence. And this is, this is needed to avoid a few of the paradoxes uh, in Norman Malcolm's version of the ontological argument. So maximal excellence uh, is the idea that some being uh, has omnipotence, you know, full, total power, total knowledge, and total goodness, let's say, maybe total wisdom. Uh, being as maximally great, though, is, is maximally excellent, but in all possible worlds. So it's not just that this being happens to be maximally excellent in this, in the way reality is, but there's other ways reality could be configured whereby that being is different. If this, if this is a maximally great being, then that being has to be that maximally excellent in any way that reality could be configured. There's no way reality could be configured whereby such a being fails to have all these properties and therefore fails to exist. And because of these two definitions now, we don't need existence to be a predicate. In, nowhere in my first two definitions of excellent and great do I consider existence or even necessary existence is a predicate. Instead, we just have talk about these properties and if a being doesn't exist, well then it doesn't have these properties. I, I, I can't talk about, say, you know, my car you know, is like blue or something like that if I don't have a car. You know, that statement would be false. And, and so, if we have a maximally great being, that being has to exist in all possible worlds because that being has to have certain properties in all possible worlds. And so Alvin Plantinga came up with this argument. He said it's, it's metaphysically possible uh, that a maximally great being exists. Uh, then if, it, that, if it's possible, then it exists in a possible world, you know, a way reality could be configured. If that being exists in a possible world, uh, again, if it's maximally great, then it exists in every possible world, and if it exists in every possible world, then it exists in the actual world, and therefore that such a being exists. Uh, therefore, we have an equivalence relation. Now, the possibility of a maximally great being existing is equivalent to the maximal great being existing. And the possibility of such a being not existing is equivalent to the being not existing. So, one of these is true, but it's only possible, only one of these two is possible. It's either possible that a maximally great being exists, or it's possible that a maximally great being does not exist, but not both. So, which one do we choose? Uh, well, again, those other premises, 2 through 5, that's, that's, um, sorry, that's these guys here. 2 through 5 are relatively uncontroversial. Uh, Saul Kripke is pretty well established in metaphysical possibility in the field of, of philosophy. And so these uh, other premises really don't, I mean, uh, don't have much controversy. But premise 1 is a very controversial premise because uh, it is equivalent to the existence of God. Uh, so why should we believe premise 1 over its negation? Or why should we believe it's possible that a maximally great being exists and not that it's possible that a maximally great being doesn't exist? Well, consider unicorns, right? We've got two premises. One is that it's possible, uh, there's a possible world where unicorns exist. And secondly, there's a possible world where it's impossible that unicorns exist. Now, the, again, these are equivalent to the uh, affirmation and denial of premise one of the ontological argument. 
Now, which one seems, obviously, you know, the first one, you, seems much more plausible. It seems much more plausible that there's a possible world where unicorns exist than it is that there's a possible world where it's impossible for unicorns to exist. And our, our reason for this is the coherence. The idea of a unicorn is at least uh, coherence, and that should give us reason, then, to believe that it's at least possible, metaphysically possible, for unicorns to exist rather than the, the impossibility. The two just are not on epistemic par. We have a lot more reason to believe the first one than we do than we have its negation. Also, if that's not good enough, we also have the modal perfection argument. Uh, Robert Madel developed this in the Black Hole Companion to Natural Theology. He said if a property is a perfection, its negation is an imperfection. Uh, so, and a, a perfection might be something like a property necessary to, to be maximally great. So perfection would be omnipotence, omniscience, uh, and omnibenevolence. Uh, if necessary existence is a, is a predicate, that would also be a perfection. Uh, and so it, and its negation would be, therefore, an imperfection. And imperfections aren't going to entail perfections. If a perfection, if, if something is necessary to uh, produce maximal greatness, obviously it's not going to entail something, you know, logically require something else that prevents the being from, from being maximally great. Uh, and thirdly, maximal greatness is a perfection. I mean, if anything is necessary to be maximally great, you have to be maximally great to be maximally great. I mean, number three is basically a tautology. Uh, so all three of them seem basically, I mean, almost tautologies. They all, almost seem to be just I mean, undeniable, as though uh, they just the second part of the statement just repeats the first part. But if we affirm these now, uh, if we assume that maximal greatness is coherent, but not possibly instantiated, so uh, maybe it's logically, uh, you know, maximal greatness is logically possible, but metaphysically impossible. Well, is that is that can, can that be the case? Well, uh, if that were the case, then necessarily all beings would have the negation of maximal greatness, right? If, if, it's, if there's no possible world where maximally great being exists, everything would lack maximal greatness. They'd have the negation. Uh, and therefore, all beings would have uh, this imperfection in all possible worlds. Necessarily, they would have this imperfection. And therefore, anything that has a property would therefore have this imperfection, which is just to say that all properties entail an imperfection, which means that there are no properties, or I mean, there's no perfections. I mean, uh, because obviously perfections don't entail imperfections, and if every property entails an imperfection, then there are no perfections. But we just said maximal greatness is a perfection. We just that was premise three of our argument, uh, and so we come up with a contradiction, and therefore what Madel was able to prove is that the coherence of maximal greatness, uh, the logical coherence of maximal greatness is equal to the possibility of a maximally great being existing, which is equivalent, then, also to uh, a maximally great being existing, as Alvin Flanagan himself has argued. And so what we've come up with is that the existence of God is logically equivalent to the coherence of theism. So if we can prove the coherence of theism, we have a proof for the existence of God. And if we have a, a proof for the incoherence of theism, we'd obviously have a proof for the... Uh, non-existence of God as well. So, uh, here's the responses that skeptics will give to the ontological argument. The first is to parody it. This has gone as far back as Gonilo of Marmatures, uh, because arguments that prove too much don't prove anything at all. For example, uh, arguments from Hume uh, have said that we can't really know anything. Well, can we know that? Uh, it, it's sort of the universal acid that you can never use because it destroys anything uh, you put it in. Uh, also, if you can derive these absurd conclusions from similar and equally plausible premises, it shows that there's something wrong in the argument. It doesn't show what's wrong in the argument, but it shows that at least something is wrong with the argument. Uh, secondly, we can deny the coherence of theism to respond to the ontological argument. Again, the coherence of theism is logically equivalent to the existence of God. So, if we deny the coherence of theism, then we can deny the existence of God. How do we do this? Well, as a philosopher, you need to give an argument. You don't normally just assert things like this. Uh, well, you could do, as J.L. Mackey did, and give arguments against the uh, divine properties. You could say maybe omnipotence is incoherent because uh, you know an omnipotent being would be able to create 
a stone too heavy for him to lift, but if he could do that, then he wouldn't be able to lift it, and in either case, it wouldn't be omnipotent. So there's arguments like that. Uh, you could pr show the properties are not compossible, meaning they can't all exist in the same being. Uh, maybe omnibenevolence would interfere somehow with omniscience, so that omnipotence or omniscience would restrict one's omnipotence. If you know what you're going to do, you can't do otherwise. Uh, so that might be an argument that they're not compossible. Or you could turn the modus ponens into a modus tollens. So a modus ponens is like, if it's raining outside, then my car is wet. It's raining outside, therefore my car is wet. It's modus ponens. Modus tollens is when you flip it around. You say, ah, but my car is not wet, therefore it's not raining outside. So you could say, yeah, but God, you know, if uh, theism is coherent, then God exists. But God doesn't exist, and it's your job to prove the otherwise. Therefore, you know, theism is not coherent. I dare you to, to, to give an argument to the contrary. So, that, you know, the atheist might just fold his arms and say, yeah, prove the coherence of, uh, of God, Mr. Mr. Philosopher. And so that's what we're, we're going to try to do now, uh, after we go through a couple of the parodies. All right. So, first is the island parody, like, uh, which is the same argument Alvin Plantinga gave, but we put the word island instead of being. Uh, the problem with, with this is that what makes an island great is much more subjective than what makes a being great. Uh, someone might prefer a desert island, someone might say, you know, uh, a tropical island might be better, some might say, uh, one, you know, one that's maybe a bit drier, it might be a better island. How, how big is it? There's a lot of subjectivity there. Also, power and knowledge and goodness have these intrinsic maxima. Power would top out at omnipotence of infinite power, or the ability to actualize any possible state of affairs. Uh, knowledge would top out at knowing all truths and believing no falsehoods. Uh, whereas the properties of an island don't. How, however large the island is, is, you can make it larger. However uh, much beautiful stuff there is, you can always add more. Uh, however much good stuff is on the island, you can just keep adding. So there's sort of no, no limit. This might even be the case with a, you know, the best best of all possible worlds. There might not be a best of all possible worlds as well. There might, you know, for any world that exists, there might be a better one with just more good stuff. Uh, and so these intrinsic maxima to an island or even to reality itself just may not have a, a maximum to it. Uh, it also assumes that existence is a predicate. When you're, you're going to use being uh, versus island. If you can plug island, the word island is a predicate. I mean, that's I mean part of what it means to be an island. You know, such and such is an island. Uh, but to say such and such is a being in the same sense, you're assuming that being is a predicate in the way an island is a predicate. So you're assuming existence is a predicate, and therefore you're just giving in to, to saying, you know what, the Kant's criticism just has no validity. You you just thrown in the towel uh, to Anselm at that point. So, uh, also, if space begins to exist, then no physical object can be metaphysically necessary. And so there cannot be any sort of maximally great physical thing. And so these are the problems with uh, the island. A few problems. There's a bunch more with the island parody. Also, maybe an evil god. This is like, uh, maybe Stephen Law and Peter Milliken were going for this. Uh, both, I think, I think Oxford scholars. Uh, anyway, so we instead of saying a maximally great being, we say a maximally effectively evil being. Uh, and, and we use that same thing, that effectively evil being would have to be metaphysically necessary. Um, problems with this as well uh, is that we think of evil as a privation of good, as Augustine did. Uh, then uh, a privation is like a lack of something you, you need. Uh, for, for example, for a rock not to see, that's not a privation. It's a lack of sight, but it's not a privation. It's not like it should be there. For a human to be unable to see, that's a privation uh, of sight. It's like something that should be there but isn't. Uh, so evil eats into goodness or into existence the way that maybe decay or rust eats into your car. So to talk about a 100% or a maximally evil being is like talking about a car that's completely decayed or maybe food that's been completely rotted away 100%. Uh, that's just incoherent because anything that's decayed 100% isn't there anymore. There's no, there's no car, there's no food, there's nothing. So this, this may not even be a coherent concept. Also, most of the evil people in history had loads of good virtues. I mean, this is what made them so effective. This is what made your Hitlers 
brilliant because he was a fantastic speaker. He was a powerful intellectual, very well read if you read Mein Kampf, and that's what made him so powerful and so dangerous. So uh, there's no maximal uh, wickedness and maximal evil. There, there's plenty of good things that you have to have to be effectively evil. And if we use the term effectively evil, uh, it's also very explicitly question begging because being effectively evil just evil just means to exist. I mean, something that doesn't exist isn't effectively evil. That's the word effectively is the, is the problem that we're running into. Uh, effectively just explicitly states that something ex exists, but maximally great isn't, isn't quite as explicit uh, in its definition. So this, this also is not a very good parody of the ontological arguments. In fact, all of these, the islands and gods and even like quasi-maximally great beings. I mean, imagine a being that's omniscient, you know, that's perfect in every way except doesn't, uh, doesn't understand certain mathematical concepts. Let's say group theory, because that's really, I mean, that's hard. Or let's say, say you can't hit a one iron, right? Even God can't hit a one iron. So we have a being that's omnipotent except for the ability to, to, to hit, a, hit a one iron or, or to know a certain mathematical concepts. Uh, the problem with that is this. If we have, uh, let's say, maximal greatness explained in terms of, like, there necessarily there exists something that's totally powerful, totally knowledgeable, and totally good, quasi-maximally greatness requires that we add something. So for a maximally great island, there is something that's maximally powerful, maximally knowing, maximally good, and is an island. Uh, that's not a parallel. That's that's not really a parody. You have to give an argument for why this maximally great being is also an island, or why this maximally great being also can't hit a one iron, or why this maximally great being is also evil. These are these are sort of shoehorned onto it, and therefore, because you have to give an argument, a separate argument for that extra property, it's not dialectically parallel. And so, all of these quasi maximally great parodies being parasitic on, on maximal greatness and also shoehorning extra stuff onto it just aren't aren't parallel. They're not really good parodies. So parodying the ontological argument just isn't going to work for you. Uh, another could be like, let's let's deny the coherence of theism. So this is a, something called natural atheology. Uh, one of the last really great books arguing against it would be The Miracle of Theism. Uh, by J. L. Mackey, uh, an ardent atheist, so he's he's given arguments that maybe perfect being theology is not really coherent. This has largely been abandoned. Like even Christopher Hitchens admitted that uh, theism is at least internally coherent, even though he believed uh, it to be bad and especially religion to be just horribly monstrous. Uh, he had nothing good to say about religion, but he still admitted that it is. Uh, it is at least internally coherent. Uh, and I think Richard Carrier was the one who said that instead of destroying the concept of God and scuttling it, all it did is it forced theologians to come up with more precise formulations that get around any sort of paradoxes. And so it, uh, it's like, okay, we'll rethink our definition of God in order to get around any potential problems, and so we still have a coherent definition of God. And there's a rich literature. Brian Lefto spends quite a bit of his career defending the coherence of perfect being theology. And he has lots of, uh, lots of arguments, and none of them have really been given very good responses. Uh, so you can check out Brian Lefthouse's books as well regarding the coherence of theism. Uh, but also, I was thinking, it's not enough just to say, hey, you haven't proven theism to be incoherent. Let's, let's take the next step. Let's actually come up with an argument, not just an argument, but a, a, like a truly airtight logical proof of the coherence of the concept of perfect being theology. Now that may be crazy. I actually wrote to Alvin Plantinga and he thought, yeah, this, is, this just isn't going to work out. But at the American Philosophical Association, I met a student of Harvey Friedman who said, yeah, Friedman is developing this thing called concept calculus. And basically, concept calculus reduces informal concepts uh, into a formal sense, so you can give them uh, like a hierarchy of the interpretive power of a concept. So you can compare, say, Buddhism to Marxism and show which has more interpretive power and which has the interpretive power to interpret the other. Incoherent concepts have infinite 
interpretive power uh, in the same way that inconsistent uh, formal systems uh, can derive any and every proposition. You can, you can derive anything from an inconsistent, uh, an inconsistent uh, system, such, such as naive set theory. You, you can prove anything in its negation from it, and so it's pretty useless. So if we can fit perfect being theology into it, uh, we'll have a proof of, of the co consistency or coherence of theism. So this is a quote from Harvey Friedman. He says, what is the methodology of concept calculus? Uh, we def identify fundamental informal notions of thinking, uh, particularly in philosophical subjects. And then we consider various combinations of, of principles capable of clear and concise formulation. We experiment with those principles. Uh, and then uh, first, uh, some of these might be incompatible with others. And we can calculate the strengths of these theories. So basically, he's formalizing informal concepts using first-order logic, which is itself provably consistent and complete. And so with, with that uh, as the bedrock of our concepts, we can actually come up with these rigorous uh, proofs of the coherence of different concepts. Uh, and so this is sort of a, like the hierarchy of concepts. Uh, any, theoretically, any concept should be able to fit into the hierarchy. Concepts can be compared with their in, uh, interpretive strength. Uh, again, the in, inconsistent ones can interpret anything and everything, and therefore, uh, if we can show that theism interprets anything and everything, uh, then it is, in fact, inconsistent. But our plan is, again, fitting perfect being theology somewhere into this hierarchy. Now, the hierarchy has no upper bound except for inconsistency. But with inconsistent concepts, there's no upper bound for interpretive strength. So if we can fit it, let's say, between two different concepts that we know to be themselves coherent, or show that, that perfect being theology is coherent relative to another concept which we all believe to be coherent, then we will have a consistency proof for perfect being theology. And so the rest of this lecture, I'm bringing it from Harvey Friedman's article in the book Infinity, New Research Frontiers. He did, took an entire chapter on concept calculus. Now, this is very like logical, mathematical, and, and difficult uh, to grasp. This part of the presentation is really more for professional philosophers, but it is just hang with me. I'll try to interpret this as much in ordinary common sense concepts. So he, he talks about how two systems can interpret one another, uh, and he gives his sort of formal uh, rules for it. Remember, a formal system needs needs objects, it needs rules, and, and it, it needs uh, axioms. So you have like objects, rules for manipulating the objects, and then axioms, which are your starting points. Think of the game of chess, where you have like a chess board, and you have different objects, uh, like a pawn, and a king, and a rook, and each one has certain properties. There are certain things you can do at certain times. These are the rules of chess. And then you have your axiom, which is going to be the opening position of chess. And you could show whether certain things are theorems or not theorems of the system. For example, if some side has nine pawns, that's provably not a theorem of the system because you don't start with nine pawns and because there's no way of getting a ninth pawn uh, once you have eight pawns. But yet something like where someone has two bishops on the same colored square, let's say both, both on black, that is a theorem. That's often a theorem of the system because you can take your one of your pawns. It, you know, if you have a let's say a bishop on the black squares, you take a pawn to the eighth square, uh, and then it can become a bishop as well, also on the black square. So that, that can be a theorem of the system. So that that's all we're doing with formalisms. Uh, and so now, basically, we've got like the domain of objects uh, and all the like the functions uh, in the system. Uh, and so here's sort of the axioms for what he calls basic. We're going to take this idea of much better than and better than, which are pretty informal concepts, and we're going to give it a rig rigorous formalism. So here's the axioms he gave to these two ideas. Uh, for basic, it's like nothing is better than itself. Uh, different uh, relationships between better than or much better than. Like if something's much better than something else, then the thing is better than something else, but not the reverse. So much better than is like a greater relationship. Uh, so these are the basic axioms. And then you can extend these basic axioms into different systems. So diverse exactness, unlimited improvement, strong unlimited improvement, strong. And he also has two others that are like very strong. Diverse exactness and very strong unlimited improvement. There are certain combinations of these axioms uh, in these systems with basic 
whereby you will get uh, equivalent systems. Uh, there, there's certain ways you can derive certain systems from other systems, and there's combinations that are just inconsistent, and you can prove anything and, and everything. And he goes through this in brutally rigorous mathematical detail. Uh, most of this, a lot of this chapter, I'd say maybe half of it, is just everything stated in first order predicate logic and just going through just logical proof after proof after proof of this. So I'll, I'll spare you sort of the kind of difficulty of that. Um, he, he also gives a model in these three. Uh, he, these are the, so there's L, it's your model. You have equality being greater, being better than, and then being much better than. So the middle one is much better than relationship. So we can derive uh, for strong diverse exactness from basic and very strong diverse exactness, uh, or, or super strong diverse exactness. So uh, we can derive it from uh, a couple other th a couple other systems. So there's there's certain ways of combining uh, a couple of these guys, like basic and very strong or and, and strong diverse exactness will give you diverse exactness as well. You can actually derive diverse exactness, those axioms, as a theorem if you take basic and, and strong diverse exactness. So there's certain combinations that are equivalent, or technically equivalent to others. You can derive the same stuff from them. Uh, and then he says you can use like Zermelo, which is a weak uh, fragment of Zermelo set theory, in order to run your comparisons and to add your objects as sets. Uh, and we can show certain ones are inter mutually interpretable, uh, and all of them can be interpreted in ZFCs, Zermelo Frankel choice, uh, which is a common and popular set theory. Uh, they can all be mutually interpreted uh, through that. Uh, so the takeaway and conclusion concept calculus can take informal ideas like better than and much better than, give them a rigorous formalism. Again, they're only as good as their axioms, but there's ways of axiomatizing these uh, formulations of them to show which ones imply which other ones and which combinations of them are inconsistent. Because you can't just uh, assert all of these, like diverse unlimited improvements, you know, strong diverse exactness, and then super strong diverse exactness and super strong unlimited. You can't uh, affirm all of the axioms because you will get contradictions. So you have to choose which which one which ones are going to be used in your systems and which ones you're going to throw out. And so he used concept calculus then to show to compare the interpretive strength of these these systems, you know, diverse exactness and limited improvement and, and such and such, you know, in order uh, to show their their stuff in the hierarchy and to show that some of these are inconsistent and can be derived at, uh, anywhere. Concept calculus is in its infancy; it's very early on. But if we have a way of using this concept calculus to get uh, a, like a proof of uh, to, to get theism, if we can fit perfect being theology into this and show that you can compare its proof strength or its interpretive power to other systems known to be consistent, then we would have at least a relative consistency proof for perfect being theology. And if perfect being theology is at least as consistent as, say, you know, first order predicate logic, we'd have as close to an ironclad proof of the coherence of theism and therefore the existence of God uh, as we'll ever have, or as you could have for anything. And so to deny the existence of God would be like to deny uh, the law of non-contradiction or the law of identity or the laws of logic themselves. Hopefully, with more research, we will be able to come up with such a strong proof in order to render atheism completely and utterly irrational. This is the Messianic True. Shalom Aleichem.